introduce the speaker. Today's session on 5G core is brought to you by uh, uh, Mr. Sanjay Kumar. Uh, Sanjay is an entrepreneur and a senior telecom and cloud uh, trainer. So as a senior telecom and cloud uh, professional, uh, he has uh, 19 plus years of experience in telecom industry and he has worked in uh, many different ro roles, uh, training, operations and maintenance, uh, leading projects, uh, content development, telecom R&D, testing and so forth. Beyond that, uh, you know, some of the disciplines in which he has worked is business development, client en engagement, corporate strategy, commercial management, across multiple domains of both telecom and cloud. He has trained, uh, you know, more than 10K people, 10,000 people in uh, more than 150 countries on various uh, technologies, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, packet core, cloud technologies, in many well-known companies, including Nokia, Ericsson, Vodafone, Cisco, Airtel, Geo, Wipro. So the list goes on. Uh, he is uh, he was uh, previously with the NanoCell Networks for uh, more than 10 years. And as a spin-off from NanoCell, there is another company called Learniso Global. So right now he is one of the founders of Learniso Global. And uh, again, the focus of this company is telecom training. Now you know that uh, you know, unlike uh, 4G, a lot of 5G infrastructure is uh, built upon uh, you know, virtualization, uh, microservices and other aspects of cloud computing. So it's no surprise that Sanjay has uh, got him, in, himself trained and be, uh, you know, well versed in areas of cloud technology. In fact, he's also a AWS certified solution architect. So with that introduction, uh, yeah, uh, we are pleased to welcome Sanjay uh, to deliver this talk. Uh, over to you, Sanjay. Yeah, thanks, Arvind. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I hope everyone is able to hear me and uh, just let me know. Uh, Arvind, uh, is my voice clear? Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, yes. Your voice is clear and I can see your screen now. Great. Yeah, thanks. So uh, good evening all. Uh, my name is Sanjay Kumar and thanks uh, uh, Aravind for the beautiful introduction as well as uh, the great initiative where you have taken on the Devopedia. Right. So we are connected since long and then uh, we have done some trainings together on IoT and stuff like that. Uh, as he has mentioned, uh, I am currently working with a company called Learniso Global where I'm one of the founder. We work on the telecom and the cloud technologies, training and consulting kind of areas. Today's discussion is going to be about 5G core. 5G core, as we also call this as a 5G next generation core or 5GC, right? So how it is going to be different? What are the new things which are coming in the 5G core? We are going to discuss this in particular session. And we will also touch upon on the some fundamentals related to the different protocol structure, service-based architecture and stuff like that. We will be taking uh, questions in between. So after every few slides, I will be pausing and then maybe Arvind uh, can uh, unmute uh, you guys and then you can ask two questions. And at the end of the session also, we will take uh, maybe another 10 minutes to take questions and answer and then uh, interact with each other. Uh, I hope that's okay. Now, uh, what we are going to discuss in this particular session is like we will talk about the 5G key enablers where we will talk about major enabler for both radio and code. However, major focus is going to be around code. So we'll not talk much into the radio aspect of it, but we'll just touch upon on those fundamentals. But majorly we will talk about the core network. We will also see, uh, look at the EPC limitations. Uh, we will understand what were the limitation we had with the EPC evolved packet code and how we are going to resolve those problems, resolve those issues in the 5G core network. And but what's new in 5G core network? One of the major component uh, of uh, 5G core network is named as SBA. We call it as service based architecture. So we'll understand what is SBA protocol stack and what are the different interfaces following that particular protocol stack. In addition to SBA, we have some other interfaces like N1, N2, N3 and N4. We will talk about those interfaces and the protocols on those interfaces. And at the end of our session, we'll quickly talk about uh, the UE registration part of it. When UE is getting registered with the 5G core network, what are the typical messages which are flowing in the network? So this is going to be agenda for our session today. 
a quick introduction before uh, if you wish to connect with me i am pretty active on linkedin uh, you can connect uh, to me on linkedin i have around 14000 connection across 187 countries right so i keep on writing articles sharing videos on my linkedin uh, i have uh, a youtube channel with the name learn 5g so uh, you can actually uh, we have uh, uh, organized lot of uh, open sessions on 5g radio 5g core open ran and stuff like that so you can subscribe to this channel uh, so with the name learn 5g you will find out this channel and uh, we also have a telegram group uh, where we keep on interacting on various topics on 5g and related things stuff right so you can connect to me on uh, linkedin on my youtube channel as well as on my telegram channel group right so this is me i have around 20 years of work experience almost 14 years i have spent in training i have uh, multiple organizations i have worked with lanizo global nfc networks and i'll not spend much time on this uh, since uh, arvind has already spoken about it i started working with 2g kind of technologies and now i'm with working on 5g transmission ip packet code etc these are the technologies i have worked with various telecom products samsung nokia ericsson zte cisco these are the various products i worked with so i'll not spend much time here since arvind has already introduced me 5g key enablers one of the major change which is coming in the 5g world is the cloud intervention if we look till 4g for in initial level of 4g there was no cloud intervention all hardware based network all vendor specific hardware and softwares since the latest stage of uh, epc where we started talking about virtual epc right so we have started moving moving about uh, cloud native architecture and that's where cloud has started entering into the telecom world and today we see around uh, the complete 5g core network deployments are happening on the cloud as well as even the radio networks are moving towards cloud so of course we'll not talk much about the radio part of it but this is what we have in the cloud the cloud is actually getting into both radio and core core anyway is more or less completely cloudified radio is still little here and there so some companies they are very aggressive about building radio network on the cloud architecture some companies are little skeptical to do that so but it's it's getting there uh, with the radio as well of course uh, in radio network the kind of frequency what we use we are going to get into the ultra dense network we are going to have macro cell micro cell pico cells we also have something called as mm wave which is called as millimeter wave millimeter wave is typically very very small cells where we are using frequencies beyond 24 gigahertz and something like that massive mimo uh, a system where we have multiple antennas for the transmission and reception just to give you better coverage better capacities depending on the radio conditions right so mimo is becoming integral part of any future generation networks mmw where we use frequencies in the range of 20 to 100 gigahertz or maybe beyond that as well however today the users are very demanding on the latency part of it if you want to give better consumer experience quality of experience to the consumers you have to reduce the latencies and to do that we have to bring the computing resources closer to the end user and that's where edge computing comes into play and in case of cellular network we call it as mec multi axis edge computing lot of public safety verticals they talk about d2d services device to device communication some examples like mcptt mission critical ptt group communication services prose proximity services so you can also utilize your wireless network for public safety verticals as well of course nfv and sdn they play very important role when you talk about the cloud architecture so creating all the network function in the as a virtualized network function and we we are moving towards from vms we are getting into the the containers so docker kubernetes these these things have become very very normal talks in the telecom which were not there few years back few years back nobody knows uh, containers or virtual machines in telecom world today everybody talks about it 
One uh, great stuff which comes with 5G is called as network slicing. However, network slicing is not something new to the telecom world. We had various uh, ways to segregate the traffic, segregate the network by using APN, by using quality of service. But that doesn't guarantee you something. But now we are getting into dividing your one physical infrastructure into multiple logical network where every logical network is called as a slice. So one slice is like one logical network and that's where we can actually offer these slice as a service. So typically they call this as NSAS, network slice as a service. So that is something which is very, very important for the 5G businesses to grow. A lot of enterprise, a lot of public safety verticals, a lot of vertical industries can be targeted for providing some dedicated slices for those businesses or those industries. However, to do all these things, one important stuff is the end-to-end -end efficient management of the network, and that's where orchestration becomes very critical. So network orchestration is also very important function of 5G world. So these are some of the major key enablers for 5G networks. However, we will majorly talk about the core network part of it. Now let's talk about evolving from EPC to 5G core network. If you remember, uh, some of you may be aware about the EPC network architecture where we had three components, major components. One is MME, S gateway and P gateway. In the radio part of it, we used to have something called as E node B. In the database part of it, we had two components. One is HSS, another one is PCRF, right? So HSS is like HLR subscription database. PCRF is managing all the quality of service policies and charging stuff like that. Where MME takes care of the control plane part of it and S gateway and P gateway typically takes care of the user plane part of it. But that's not a complete statement because S gateway and P gateway are also doing something called as control plane in between them, right? So in case of 5, 4G, later version of 4G, we started talking about something called as CUPS, where CUPS stands for separation of control plane and user plane. We typically divide the control plane and user plane part, and that's what we are going to follow in 5G as well. However, this EPC had so many limitations. We are going to talk about some of those. So first of all, there were too many telecom proprietary protocols. When I say telecom proprietary protocols, I'm not saying they are pro proprietary protocol for the vendors, but specifically designed for 4G network. However, they were not using any standard protocols in case of 4G network. However, in 5G, what we are trying to do is we are going to scrap majority of these protocols and we have started using protocols like HTTPS. So HTTPS is one of the most popular protocol used in the IT world. And now in telecom also, we are started, we have started using scrapping many protocols and started using HTTPS kind of protocols, right? So we used to have a protocol like diameter towards HSS, a protocol like SGS AP towards MSC VLR, GT, PC, GTP, GPRS telling protocol C towards SGW, S1 AP towards E node B. So the whole idea is to just scrap all these protocols and move away from those protocols towards HTTPS so that you can integrate your 5G code network with the future networks. The another limitation with the EPC was the networks were pretty closed. What do you mean by closed? Today, if you see most of the businesses, they look at Facebook, Google, WhatsApp, they all earn from the advertising. How they really earn their money? They earn with advertising. And because of that, they give access to their resources to the companies who want to run their ads. However, telecom networks were pretty close networks and there were no or limited third party access. However, in case of 5G, we, in case of 4G also, we came with some concept called as SCEF system capability exposure function 
which is typically used for iot kind of use cases which can actually expose the 4g network data to the third party servers in 5g we are taking it to the whole next level which is called as nef nef stands for network exposure function nef network exposure function which can actually expose the capability of the 5g network as well as the user to the third party servers so that more value added services can be provided to the end users the gateway selection were inflexible so it's, it was not easy to play with the user plane gateways so we have some configuration possible some configuration not possible however in case of 5g we have complete flexibility of actually deploying our user plane function so you can have chaining of user plane branching uplink classification and n number of other stuff what you can do with the user plane and that enables us to bring user plane closer to the end user and provides services which are categorized under edge computing so in edge computing you have to bring some of the user plane closer to the g node b closer to the base station so that you can have lower latencies and that flexibility is available in 5g it was very limited in case of 4g networks last but not the least uh, the limitation of hardwares majority of telecom networks and not only the uh, the the customer is not worried about it but the end operators were really uh, actually scared with the different kind of hardware so you have a lot of piece of hardware and every new generation you get into your complete previous generation hardware gets into scrap so they were actually looking for some networks which are software networks not hardware based network where they can build these hardware networks on the cords hardware so today in the all the future networks they are actually building not the based not the hardware for mme not the hardware for hss s gateway or p gateway but they are building a single hardware which is actually a cords hardware commercial of the shelf hardware and they are deploying applications so one vm is mme another vm is hss and so on and so forth right so we are moving away from the hardware based architecture and we are getting into data center kind of architectures where all these things can be implemented with the software not with the hardware not with the vendor specific hardware i'll say right so these are some of the limitations we had with epc i'm not saying uh, it's only with 5g it is happening even in epc we had something called as vepc virtual epc and you can even implement this virtual epc on a private cloud you can build your own private cloud or you can also build this virtual epc on a public cloud like aws right and recently if you have heard some announcements uh, there is a company called dish network in us which is a 5g operator and they have tied up with aws to deploy the complete 5g workloads on the aws infrastructure instead of deploying their own hardware own piece of hardware right so this is something which is happening in the telecom world today so just a quick comparison uh, in 2g and 3g and 4g mostly networks were hardware based network elements dedicated core networks functional entities proprietary protocols and because of hardwares and proprietary protocols these were not scalable in case of 5g we are moving away from the telecom proprietary protocol we are getting into service based architecture where we use some generic protocols we are using virtualization slicing cloudification softwareization for all the communication we are using restful apis so we will understand what is restful api and where do we really implement that all the communication is happening on the protocols like https json kind of uh, communication we also have exposure to the third parties and it provides some backward and some forward compatibilities as well but this is a little overstatement because 5g doesn't do completely uh, completely does the backward compatibility and forward never is never guaranteed so backward is little overstatement here because just to give an example 5g doesn't really define interworking with 2g and 3g it defines interworking only with the 4g we will understand why do we why we are doing it right so we'll talk about it so when we look at this uh, we had mme which is doing control plane hss which is doing control plane pcrf which is doing control plane serving gateway was doing control plane and user plane pdn gateway was doing control plane and user plane 
So what we are doing here is we are just separating the control plane and user plane part of it and the user plane part is broken brought to the UPF user plane function. The control plane part is brought to SMF session management function. The MME functionality is majorly taken over by something called as AMF access and mobility management function. The HSS functionality is brought to UDM and AUSF authentication server function and policy and charging functionality is brought to PCF. PCF is policy control function. The charging functionality is brought, brought to another function which is called as CHF. So what we are doing here is we are breaking down the network function into smaller network function and build those network functions on containers so that all those network functions can scale independently. So because of the virtualization, because of containerization, we can actually allow all these network functions to scale independently from each other. That's what we are trying to do in case of 5G. However, if you look at the reference point architecture, what do we mean by reference point architecture? This architecture is just for our reference. This is not the actual implementation of 5G core network because all the interfaces, what you look at in this picture here, they are all non existent. They are just for our reference. Why? Because all these things are built on something called as HTTP 2 based protocol using virtualization, using RESTful APIs, then that we will see in the next couple of slides. So this particular architecture is just reference point representation that is just for our reference. It is not used in the actual implementation. The actual implementation is more or less different. However, some interfaces will remain as it is like N1, N2, N3, N4, N6, N9. We will talk about all these interfaces, but most of the interfaces above this line, they are service based architecture. They use implementation of HTTP or JSON kind of protocols. These are some of the abbreviation uh, like AMF, Access and Mobility Management Function, AUSF, Authentication Server Function, PCF, NSSF, NEF, NRF. We will talk about some of these network functions in the next couple of slides. But before we jump to this slide, uh, just wanted to pause for a minute and take up any questions if we have. Uh, Arvind, I'm not able to look at the chat box uh, or maybe if they want to unmute, they can unmute themselves and ask those questions. So we can pause for a minute and then move forward with the service based architecture. Yeah, thanks Sanjay. Uh, so those who have questions, you can unmute your mic and ask. Do we have any questions here? I have a question uh, regarding your previous slide. Uh, you yeah. said the interfaces are non-existent, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, let's say between AMF and AUCF, mm -hmm. there may be a network call using HTTP. Can't you consider that call as part of the N N12 interface? Right. So if you see, uh, if, when we look further, when we see or uh, when AMF is actually communicating with a AUSF, right? So this will be happening over a interface called as NAUSF. Right, so there will be a call to NAUSF. You can always give a reference to N12, right? But N12, uh, N12 specific protocols are not there. So nothing specific to an interface here. That's why I'm saying non-existent. Okay, okay. Right. So when, that it's not a specific protocol. Yeah, so there is no specific protocol like if you see earlier telecom when we talk about there used to be a specific protocol for every interface or uh, let me put it this way interfaces were defined based on the protocols right however now the, the difference will be on this name NAUSF so whenever AMF wants to talk to NAUSF as we see further it will be giving a call to NAUSF and after that it will be adding its message saying that okay hey this is what I want to communicate to NAUSF. Right, so there is no N12 specific protocol. That's why I'm saying they're non-existent. They're just for reference. Does that make sense, Arvind? Yes, yes, thanks for the clarity. Okay, any other questions from anybody? Okay, then let's move forward. Uh, so now if you look at this, 
this is again not a service bus kind of stuff it may look like service bus in this picture but again all these things what we see here they are built into a single cloud infrastructure it can be single it can be multiple cloud infrastructure and all these are independent vms or containers basically they are not even vms they are actually a suite of services they are all suite of services and all these services are implemented as microservices in the containers so basically the network functions what we see here they are not even vnfs they are the cnf containerized or cloud native network function and they are actually created as a microservices or a collection of microservices now if you look at this amf is more or less similar to mme most of the mme functions are done by amf mobility management and stuff like that the s gateway and p gateway control plane is brought to smf session management function the user plane part is brought to user plane function the pcrf is now broken down to two part one is pcf another one is chf policy control function and charging function the hss is broken down to three pieces one is udm user unified data management ausf authentication server function and the another one is repo data repository called as udr unified data repository but there are some network functions what you see which we have not seen in the previous generations these are named here as nrf network repository function nef network exposure function and nssf network slice selection function let me write three names here repository exposure and slice selection so basically the repository is not for the user repository of network functions that means there can be multiple instance of amf multiple instance of smf multiple instance of pcf multiple instance of ausf so every time that one network function wants to talk to another network functions they have to check from nrf so nrf acts as a yellow pages nrf acts as a yellow pages so every time you want to check something you want to get some services this is like when i want to get a pizza or a burger i simply go to google or just i look for some pizza shops around and then order the pizza to that shop right so basically the service is provided by ausf but they are published by at nrf so that amf can check nrf and get to know about ausf so nrf becomes like a broker becomes like a yellow pages for the network function the nef is a network function which is to expose the 5g network expose when i say i'm talking with the controlled exposure so it should be controlled exposure where 5g network services can be exposed to the external world nssf is network slice selection function which will help amf which will help amf to select the slices however we will not get into the details of this you can actually look at my some videos on my youtube channel where i've talked about the detailed discussion on these topics right but nssf is just helping the amf to choose the right slices for the user right in addition to this and if you look at this all these names have a interface name service these are called as service based interface sbi and all the communication happens via sbi so basically whenever you are calling nssf you have to call an interface which is called as n nssf we will see where do we really have these numbers have these values right so uh, we will understand we will talk a bit more about it right when somebody wants to talk to amf it has to talk to n amf whenever somebody want to talk to udm it has to talk to n udm like that right so this interface becomes more important than the reference point interfaces what we have seen but sba is majorly into control plane 
the user plane part is still more or less the reference point so you have n1 which is for nas communication n2 which is like g node b to n amf in communication which was earlier having s1 interface in 4g which is now called as ng interface next generation interface so in 4g we had s1 interface now we call this as ng interface n3 which is between g node b and upf n4 is between smf and upf which is typically using a protocol called as pfcp packet forwarding control protocol n6 is nothing but just the ip kind of data going to external data networks right so this architecture remains more or less the same like 4g but the control plane architecture is completely different in case of 5g now let's have a look at the sba protocol stack and the protocol sorry stack and the protocols for sba if you look at this uh, this is nothing but the same tcp ip kind of protocol stack sorry one second tcp ip kind of protocol stack on top of that we have http2 protocol the lower layer it is recommended to use tls transport level security even though if you don't want to use it that's okay you can use your own mechanism you can use without security as well but it is recommended to use the security protocol as tls on top of that we use serialization as json javascript object notation so all the messages which were earlier sent as diameter protocol gtpc protocol all these messages are written in json now right and they all use http2 methods which are like port get detail typically in case of uh, i'm not a software a developer software engineer typically we call this as crud c create read update delete these kind of operations and few more operations so we use call them uh, http2 methods port get delete update post kind of methods right and just to summarize on json is used as a serialization protocol so just to summarize uh, is using http2 protocol to transport json messages in the restful api style this is how all the network functions communicate with each other right so this is the way they are all communicating with each other in the restful api style right now in the restful api communication there will be one network function working as a producer another network function working as a consumer any network function can be producer for some of the services can be consumer for some of the services so the producer will get a request from the consumer and reply to the consumer with the requested information but even before doing this even before doing that there will be repository so you are opening a new shop you are opening a new dosa shop here so what you have to do is from the day one you have to go to google and publish your information there go to the yellow pages and publish your information there because customers are not aware about this new dosa shop which is open right so what they have to do is they have to go to google and look for the shops there if they find find a new shop they may want to try the new dosa new dosa on offer in your shop and then they can place a request for the dosa and you can provide the dosa to the consumer so every communication happening between the network functions it is happening via nrf network repository function there are few more details which we are not getting into it the few more limitations so they have some kind of caching some kind of other information here we are not getting into detailed messages here but just at a high level we are talking about all these things now just to answer uh, the question of uh, arvind what he has asked if we look at this every network functions they have certain services and amf communication if you see everything starts with namf 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 so this is the service based interface this is the service provided by this network function the first service is communication the second service is event exposure the third service is mt can somebody tell me what is mt mt is mobile terminating 
so if any of the network function wants to tell the amf saying that hey can you please page the user so in that case they have to use a service which is called as namf mt namf mt is called as namf mobile terminating want to update the location it will go with namf location similarly there are some services about us so if you really want to know more about these services you can simply go to the technical specification 23.502 so there are all service messages which are mentioned in this particular document somewhere around some uh, 286 page or something starting with that page they, they have provided the complete information about these messages what you see in this particular picture so for every network function there is a collection of services and every service can be defined as a microservices and can be hosted in a container or a docker container or maybe any other container and can be orchestrated by using kubernetes kind of orchestration tools just to give you a little more idea namf communication one of the main service of amf event exposure other nfs to subscribe mt to make ue reachable namf location allows nf to get location of the ue that's not all because just having four services will not suffice so what we have done is we have got multiple service operations so with every service we have got service operations we have got operation semantics there are two types of operations one is request and response another one is subscribed and notify right so there can be one dosa shop there can be one dosa shop where you say hey i order for a dosa and get the dosa right but there can be another one which is subscription based they say whenever you get a new magazine just notify me i will come come to you and i'll collect that magazine right so like that so there can be two different kind of operation semantics one is request response another one is subscribe and notify and this talks about the known consumers who can consume these services so if you look at first four services these are the amf services but can be consumed by other amfs only because you can have multiple amfs in your network for some other information amf and lmf lmf is location management function some other services event exposure for these network function mt can be there for smf can be there for smsf can be there for udm and stuff like that so we have service based interface this we have service based interface service name and the service operation so there are multiple service operation associated with one particular service name as i mentioned if you really want more details about it you can simply go to a document which is 23.502 technical specification from 3gp.org right so you can look at all these details there right just uh, to compare some terminology between 4g and 5g in 4g we used to have imei now we call this as a pei permanent equipment identity msisdn is now called as gpsi general public subscriber identity imz is now replaced with supi and suki we will talk a bit more about it mme is now more or less taken care by amf kind of functionality s gateway and p gateway control plane part is taken care by smf user plane part is taken care by upf hss is divided into three function udm udr and ausf authentication server function online charging is taken care by chf the policy functionality is with pcf one important part part here if you are aware about 4g we used to have bearers dedicated bearers default bearers now we call them as qs flow so quality of service flow we will not get into the details of this but quality of service flow becomes the finest granularity to implement your quality of service right so that we can understand when we look at the pdu session establishment and stuff like that the pdn packet data network is now called as dn data network the apn access point name is called as dnn data network name just a quick note while they are very similar 
they are not exactly same. So this particular picture, you may have slight uh, difference of opinion. Say you, you may say that this is not exactly the same. They are more or less similar, but they are not exactly same. They have a lot of difference between them, right? So that just to give an idea, I've just shown a quick comparison between these terminologies, right? Just a quick uh, note on N1, N2, N3, and N4 protocol, and then we will open up for the questions. So N1, if you look at this, uh, we have N1, N2, N3, and N4, right? So N1 is typically used for protocol which are called as NAS protocol, known access datum. Any communication happening between the core network and the UE is called as known access datum. These are the protocols which are used on N1 interface. N2 is similar to S1. S1 interface which is called as S1 CP and now it is renamed as NG interface. The protocol here is called as NGAP protocol, next generation application protocol. N3 is the user plane part of it similar to S1U and it is still using the similar protocol called as GTPU, GPRS tunneling protocol user plane. And N4 is a new interface defined, which is using a protocol like PFCP, packet forwarding control protocol, right? So we have G node B here having N1 and N2. N1 is from UE to the core network. N2 is between G node B and the core network. And when I say core network, I'm talking about AMF. N3 is between G node B and the user plane function. If you look at the protocol stack on N2, we are using a protocol called as NGAP protocol, next generation application protocol. And on N3, we use a protocol called as GTPU, GPRS running protocol for user plane. This is not pretty new. It is used from the days of GPRS itself. From the days of GPRS, we are using this protocol called a GTBU protocol. N4 is again a very, very interesting. And if you see this, I was mainly talking with the control plane part of it, which is using a protocol called as PFCP, packet forwarding control protocol. But also it has a user plane part to it, which is not mandatory to use. But for some of the use cases, we are going to have a user plane part of it and which is using a protocol like GTPU, nothing different than that. So uh, UE registration, if you look at it quickly, we have three major differences uh, in 4G and 5G UE registration. In case of 4G, our home network is just giving the information to MME after that whole decision of authentication is taken care by MME. So the AVs, authentication vectors are coming from HSS to the MME. But in case of 5G, we have two level of authentication. When I'm saying two level, please don't get confused with the mutual authentication. When I say two level, the first authentication decision will be taken care by MME. So MME will authenticate the user first and once user is authenticated in the visited or serving network, MME will be passing on this information to AUSF and AUSF will be doing the second level of authentication, which was missing in 4G. In 4G, there was no role of home network to final, final authority to decide on the authentication that was taken care by MME only. However, it's not sorry, not MME, it's AMF, AMF. In case of 5G, we have AMF. So AMF takes the first level and AUSF takes care of the second level of authentication. In case of 4G, we were sending in Z in the clear text. In case of 5G, MZ is replaced with something called a SUPI, but even SUPI is not sent in clear text. text. SUPI is sent as a concealed identity called as SUCI or SUCI, S-U-C-I, subscription concealed identity. So you are never sending your permanent identity in the clear text so that it gives you a lot of security. In case of 4G, default bearer is set up during a registration. In case of 5G, setting up a default 
PDU session is not mandatory during registration. You want, you can do it, but it is not mandatory to do it during the registration part of it. No requirement of setting up a default bearer. Right. Now, if you look at this, we have, it, please note when I talk with this slide, this is not a complete picture. I've just discussed this at a very, very high level. It has got a lot of messages which I've not shown in this picture. Not uh, They are all eliminated. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask those questions after this slide. And I will try to answer those questions in a brief, right? So if you look at this, registration is triggered from the UE. And with this attach request, it is sending some identity, either some Suki or some 5G Guti and some additional information, right? This information is identified by RAN, recognizing new UE and sending this information to AMF with the initial UE message. And UE AMF will find out that it requires verification. It will contact AUSF with the authentication request. AUSF will talk to UDM. UDM will respond to AUSF. AUSF will respond to AMF. AMF will send a request to UE. UE will reply. And with that, we will have ACA authentication, ACA AKA stands for authentication and key agreement. We are not getting into the details of this, but this is something which is happening here between the UE, AMF, AUSF and UDM. Once that is completed, the security will be activated between the UE and AMF. After that, the UE context will be created between the G node B and AMF. And after that, access AS security will be activated and then you will be fetching all the UE policies from the PCF. PCF takes care of the UE policies and finally your registration will be completed. But as I mentioned, this is not the complete information. This very, very high level information, lot of identities to be exchanged, lot of messages to be exchanged to complete this procedure. Typically, if we talk with this Procedure itself, it will take maybe another uh, two hours to talk about this complete procedure. In this particular procedure, when we do our sessions, we typically talk about every protocol messages. We open Wireshark logs, look at those messages in those logs and discuss each and every message. That's what we do. But I just wanted to talk about this at a high level. So uh, that's all from my side. I'm open for questions. So Arvind, if you have any questions or anybody else have any questions, you, they are free to ask those questions. Uh, hello. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, okay. So I have two questions. One on the last slide uh, when security was mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just wondering whether it, what kind of security is it like a user phone tapping if you see the classical governance kind of issue. So okay. is it that or uh, like uh, as you say, IMSI code could, could not be. Uh, so I'm just one wondering about those governance part of it, like mm -hmm. if I'm a user of 5G and later mm -hmm. uh, some governance want to have a tapping on my phone and uh, my IMSI code is not, is concealed, then how does that uh, safeguard or uh, what is a governance point of view? Can they still do the phone tapping? That is one question. Okay. Second is uh, when you mentioned about this NRF, na, that uh, yellow pages. So mm -hmm. it is, is it coming, how is it implemented? Is it implemented from a, typical Korba uh, bus architecture which used to be there earlier uh, because a mm -hmm. lot of things are uh, matching like Korba kind of architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Okay, so let me answer your first question first. So if you look at this, first of all, uh, when you design or develop these products, right? So when uh, actually I talk about this, uh, they, there is always a way to have legal interception. You can't create any system which stops legal intervention. Like, so even though whatever security you create in your system, tomorrow if a lawful agency comes back to you and says, hey, I want to uh, actually intercept some of the numbers, some of the messages, some of the mobile phones, you can't say no, right? So even today WhatsApp says I have got end-to-end -end encryption. That doesn't mean they can stop legal interception. Legal interception is allowed and has to be available in any system. If it is not there, the systems will not be approved, will not be used for communication, right? That is one. 
but when i talk about these security what you see is nas security and as security non access stratum security and access stratum security that means any man in the middle right so whoever have got access to the messages in between because they use certain keys which are called as uh, some kind of kasme kmme uh, the kg node b right so when they create those keys they actually use those keys to encrypt the data as well as as well as integrity protect so basically they use two different security mechanism if you look at this name itself right so one second yeah if you see this they can be two different mechanism they can do the ciphering of every message and they can also do the integrity check so every message what ue is sending to ran and what ran is sending to ue you can activate the integrity and ciphering at the same time when ue is sending some message to amf and amf is message sending some messages to you they should be so it is not related to lawful agencies lawful agencies can still intercept those messages you can't stop lawful agencies to do that right correct correct i got it so in the previous slide you had this uh, imsi code being uh, you know concealed so in yeah. that uh, in case a lawful agency need to know the imsi is there what yeah. are the apis what are the methods or what are the let, if you go to the previous me, slide yeah, yeah let me tell you one thing uh, the imsi concept is no more there right it is now converted into something called a supi because it has got two values because uh, that's a little detailed discussion and that's why i'm not getting into it supi actually gives you uh, sorry 5g gives you access to two types of network one type of network called as 3gbp network for 3gbp network the user will have imsi another one is called as non 3gbp network non 3gbp network have another identity called as network access identifier so the lawful agencies will always have thus access similar to they used to have access like mz number supi okay let me put it this way in udm there will be a reference given to supi to suki so if somebody knows your suki they will also know your supi right amf will have some reference given to supi to guti globally unique temporary identifier which is used for temporary purpose right so there are a lot of references here so for that we have to understand all these things in detail right so all the identity there are a lot of mapping lot of uh, details here so that's why i'm not jump getting into that right uh, talking about your next question yes that uh, korba kind of implementation can be one of the way there are multiple ways to do it but as of now we'll not get into those details right so there are uh, mul option mul other options also to implement nrf right so there are uh, some vendor uh, i'll say infrastructure specific ways to do it some application specific ways to do it but we'll not get into those details as of now okay, okay. Uh, i hope that answers your questions thanks thanks thanks, 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 thanks. Yeah. any other questions from anybody arvind i hope uh, the session was okay and my pace was okay if you have any feedback any questions please feel free to ask yeah or any other question from anybody i'm open to take those questions now yeah session was good uh, inter very introductory in nature so people would have understood the concepts let's see if there are any more questions so uh, uh, what is the how is the penetration of 5g in india how is it going um, what do you mean by penetration sanjeev can you elaborate so, on that so we don't see still the 5g is happening or can i get a tomorrow 5g network spectrum is not auctioned yet right so okay. as far yes. as i know right so even spectrum auction is yet to ha happen right so companies are working on it i'm not saying companies are not working they are building uh, their own uh, technologies they are tying up with some other companies and building the technologies but uh, the commercial rollout is uh, like cannot happen until unless you have spectrum in place so they have got some test spectrums and stuff like that but uh, the commercial rollout the spectrum auction has not happened yet so you can't see any commercial okay. uh, like this rollouts as of now yeah right 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 okay any other questions from anybody 
Yeah, Nitin, please. Sanjay, I am doing a very uh, different type of question. Um, I don't know whether the question makes sense or not. No but uh, recently, we, we this uh, Indian version of uh, 5G was approved. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is 5G, called 5G. 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 Yeah. yeah. So uh, actually, I'm from uh, L1 background. So I'm just wondering whether uh, this uh, core network uh, does it change for 5G I? Uh, so if you see, I even I have not got into the complete details of 5G I, but uh, you know that uh, question was raised by the handset manufacturers. right so they were saying that we have to create two types of handset one is for 5g i one is for 5g and then it may create some problems in the global uh, roaming kind of scenarios but uh, i've not got into the details of it so i'm not uh, the right person to comment on this right now but I, i'll maybe I'll, next week i'm planning to go through the 5g i standards and maybe then i will be better placed to answer this question right so uh, i'm not sure about the 5g i architecture as of now Sure, sure. Yeah, yep. yeah. I think uh, yeah, we can always uh, talk in the yep. future. It's an interesting uh, thing to know. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank, thanks. I had a related question. question. Yeah, actually, Arvind, yeah. please go ahead. Sanjay, this Thank is Arvind. You. Yeah, Arvind, please go ahead. So Nitin asked about 5G I. Some time back, maybe couple of months back, I downloaded some of the 5G I standards which are available on HCE site. Mm-hmm. but the problem is that uh, you know it is more or less a reproduction of the entire 5g specs mm-hmm. so we don't know which parts they have changed mm-hmm. like which okay. parts are different from the normal 5g so is okay. there a alternative way to understand uh, only the changes right. because reading the whole specs of 5g it doesn't make any sense Yeah, yeah, I got, got it, man. But as of uh, Arvind, I've not got into the details of this, right? So I, I'm not placed better, uh, placed better, right? So in, uh, to answer these questions, right? So I, I actually, you know, now these questions are getting started, getting in every session of mine, right? So I think I also need to go through all these details and understand what is the difference in 5G and 5G I, right? So I think then I will be uh, able to answer these questions. So let me Come check on. this, connect offline, and talk about it. Sure. Now I tend to believe that. Uh, 5G I is uh, maybe different uh, only at uh, RAN level, maybe at uh, L1 level more, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, less in uh, core networks. Mm-hmm. Maybe probably there is may not be any difference in uh, core networks. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is just my gut feeling. <laughs> Again, I am just uh, not. Really sure. I am not the right person to comment on this as of now. But yes, uh, maybe you are right. I am not sure about it. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions? Any questions from anybody? Okay. okay. If not, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Sanjay, for that uh, useful session. I hope yeah. uh, 